Bishop Teresa Jefferson Snorton of the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church, and I serve as president of Churches Uniting in Christ, also known as CUIC. CUIC is an ecumenical organization of 10 denominations who have been working together for more than 50 years, recognizing that though we are different in organization, polity, and doctrine, we are but one church. I currently reside in Birmingham, Alabama, and my jurisdiction covers the states of Alabama and Florida. And today I'm excited to host this video webinar as a part of a series called Churches Revisioning Unity in Christ Through the Holidays. Churches Revisioning Unity in Christ Through the Holidays. Today's video takes a look at what we may not typically think of as a holiday but it is a significant celebration in the Christian tradition, and that is All Saints Day. With me today are two scholars and ministers who will lead us in our discussion. Reverend Dr. Craig Atwood is the interim dean of the Moravian Theological Seminary in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, where he is also on the faculty and the director of the Center for Moravian Studies. He's ordained in the Moravian Church, did his bachelor's degree work at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, his MDiv at the Moravian Seminary, and his PhD at Princeton Theological Seminary. He joined the faculty of Moravian College and Theological Seminary in 2010 and teaches courses in theology, history, the history of Christianity, religion in America, and the history of Christian thought. He's best known for his books, Community of the Cross, Moravian Polity in Colonial Bethlehem, and Theology of the Czech Brethren from Hus to Comenius. He's the author of over 50 academic articles, chapters in books, encyclopedia articles, book reviews, and church publications. Thank you for being with us, Dr. Atwood. Our second theologian for the day is Dr. James Howell. Dr. Howell is the senior pastor of Myers Park United Methodist Church in Charlotte, North Carolina, where he's been serving since 2003. He's a native of Columbia, South Carolina, and studied chemistry and physics at the University of South Carolina before going to Divinity School at Duke, where he earned his PhD in Old Testament. He has published over 17 books, including Yours Are the Hands of Christ, Worshipful, and Weak Enough to Lead. His book today, which he will reference, is also important to our discussion, Servants, Misfits, and Martyrs, Saints, and Their Stories. He has taught at Duke Divinity School, as well as been extensively involved in leadership within his denomination, the United Methodist Church, and in his city. Before Dr. Atwood and Dr. Howell come, let me just give a very brief history about All Saints Day. Every year on November 1st, the day after a day we're all familiar with, Halloween, many Christians around the world observe All Saints Day, which is intended to honor all saints of the church that have attained heaven. Although it's now observed in November, originally All Saints Day was celebrated on May 13th. I was excited to read that, that's my birthday. It is known that Pope Boniface IV formally started what would later be known as All Saints Day on May 13th in 609 AD when he dedicated the Pantheon in Rome as, an, uh, as a church in honor of the Virgin Mary and all the martyrs. It was Pope Gregory III during his reign between 731 and 741 AD who established November 1st as All Saints Day. That was the day when he dedicated a chapel in Rome's St. Peter's Basilica in honor of all saints. 
While many canonized saints are celebrated with their own individual day, like St. Patrick's Day, saints who have not been canonized have no particular day. And so All Saints Day is intended to recognize those who have attained heaven, but their sainthood is only known to God. Within the Catholic Church, All Saints Day is generally considered a holy day of obligation where believers would attend mass unless they're prevented by illness or other, for other reasons. After the Protestant Reformation, many Protestant traditions continue to observe All Saints Day, acknowledging it as a day of giving God earnest gratitude for the deaths, the life and the deaths of those who had lived a saintly life. The Christian celebration of All Saints Day stems from a belief that there is a powerful spiritual bond between those in heaven, the church triumphant, and those living, the church militant. All Saints Day revolves around giving God solemn thanks for the lives and deaths of his saints, both those who are famous and those who are obscure. And thus individuals in the church universal, like Paul the Apostle, Augustine of Hippo and John Wesley are honored on All Saints Day. But it is also a day that we individually remember people who have personally led us to faith in Jesus Christ or helped us in our efforts to live a Christ-like life. It could be our grandmother, a neighbor, a pastor or friend, but it is a day set aside to remember all saints. Now I want to hear from one particular faith tradition. Reverend Dr. Craig is, uh, has great expertise in Moravian theology, and within their theology are particular observances, traditions, and beliefs about saints and All Saints Day. Reverend Dr. Craig, if you would. Oh, it's such a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. And I just got out of teaching my Moravian theology class, um, and the topic has been the early Moravian church, which uh, broke away from the Catholic church before the Protestant Reformation, before the time of Martin Luther, uh, back in the 15th century. And part of the reason for breaking uh, was uh, over the issue of how to honor the saints. Uh, the Moravians uh, rejected the tradition that um, you should pray to the saints as intercessors and that you should um, observe all of the saints' days of the Catholic Church and instead embraced what they viewed was a New Testament perspective uh, that all in Christ are saints and we are called to be uh, saints but they still honored those individuals who lived exemplary Christian lives. And so they remembered the saints before the founding of the Moravian Church. Uh, these figures in the Catholic tradition, like St. Francis of Assisi, who they believed had uh, really exemplified the Christian life. Uh, one of the controversies over saints, which applies to our ecumenical work, is that one church's saint might be another church's heretic. And so the Moravians came out of what is called the Hussite Reformation, associated with Jan Hus, uh, who is the subject of one of my books, who was actually condemned by the Council of Constance and burned at the stake for heresy, on July 6th, 1415. And ever since then, people in this uh, Hussite tradition have viewed July 6th as the saint's day for Jan Hus, because he died as a martyr, even though the Catholics considered him a heretic. So even who we choose to honor can be one of those uh, divisive moments. Uh, 
Pope John, uh, uh, John Paul II went very far towards acknowledging Huss as a saint, but stopped just short of doing so, was part of that reconciliation effort. Uh, in the Moravian practice, um, we don't have many saints days we observe other than July 6th, uh, which we typically have Holy Communion that day. Uh, but we do observe All Saints Day, uh, the 1st of November. And for us, uh, sometimes we name individuals, uh, not just in the Moravian Church, great figures like John Amos Comenius or Nicholas von Zinzendorf, uh, but even figures from other churches. So we, in our liturgy, we re reference uh, that some of the martyrs, um, you know, were killed in the Roman persecution, but Martin Luther King Jr. was killed by an assassin's bullet. Uh, so we try to remember the modern saints and martyrs uh, who witnessed with uh, their life as well as their death to uh, the grace and power of God. But even more important than those heroic figures for Moravians is this idea that we are all called to be saints. And it's, it's not uncommon in the Moravian church to, um, to hear a living person referred to as a saintly person. Um, and I have my own list of uh, figures in the Moravian church that I view as living saints uh, that I wish I could live up to their example. And Moravian funerals are a very joyous occasion. Mm. Uh, lots of music, uh, uh, lots of dreaming about, you know, what heavenly joy would be like. Uh, but a very unique Moravian practice is that for every person who dies, uh, we try to tell their life story. Uh, there's a German word called Lebenslauf. Uh, sometimes the person writes it themselves before they die. Uh, often it's the pastor who writes it. Uh, for instance, I wrote my mother and my father's and my nephew's Lebensloff when they died. And these are all kept in the archives. Uh, so if you go to the Moravian archive in Winston-Salem or Bethlehem or Herrenhut, Germany, there are thousands of these little biographies of ordinary Moravian saints, and this is their last witness. And every Easter, we gather on God's acre, which is what we call our cemetery, uh, to give witness to the resurrection in the presence of those who have already gone before us. Wow. Uh, and so even though All Saints Day is one holiday in the fall, for Moravians, this is, this is part of our yearly, uh, yearly observance throughout the year. Um, and our cemeteries are, are carefully organized so that all the headstones are flat. Um, uh, so you can't tell who's rich or who's poor, who's black, white, brown, uh, who was the bishop, who was the sexton, uh, because we are all saints in Christ, and we, we really celebrate this experience. And it's important in the Moravian tradition, the idea of the communion of saints, that every time we take the Eucharist, the Holy Communion, uh, we are remembering, you know, the death of Jesus, but we're also sharing in worship with those who have gone before. Uh, I like to tell people that when we take Holy Communion in the Moravian Church, we should hear the angels and the saints singing with us as we share in this wonderful experience. And so part of what I like about, you know, what you're doing with the Churches United in Christ is, isn't it wonderful if we can recognize each other church's saints and bring them into our story? Um, I love teaching the history of Christianity and lifting up these figures who are not perfect. Uh, they are flawed. You know, Augustine of Hippo is one of my favorite saints, a deeply flawed man. 
What makes us saints is not, you know, our perfection. It's the perfection of Christ mm. who redeems us and brings us into his life of love. And as long as we live in that love, we are living saints for one another. So that's the way I understand the Moravian tradition. Excellent. Thank you so much uh, for that explanation of your particular tradition around All Saints Day. I was intrigued to hear about the funeral uh, in the African-American tradition. We call it a home going. Oh, yeah. And, and uh, while there uh, is an obituary that's written that kind of tells the life story, it is intended to be a celebration of life. And uh, I think particularly during this season in, in our lives, remembering to celebrate life is so important. So thank you, uh, Dr. Atwood. Now, uh, Dr. Howell, give us your particular perspective on uh, All Saints Day and, and why it matters and how we can refresh our thinking about All Saints Day. Well, First Bishop, thank you for uh, having me as part of this. A big passion in my life, informally and formally, has been uh, the project of Churches Uniting in Christ. I've been part of interdenominational conversations uh, with various groups and certainly with neighbors. Uh, so that's always been a great uh, pleasure. And thinking about All Saints um, at our church, we're kind of dreading All Saints Day coming because it has become the, I think, for most of our people, it's become our most beloved service of the year, uh, rivaling Christmas Eve, I would imagine, better than Easter because Easter's too dang crowded. But people love All Saints Day. We have the bagpipe and brass, and we come in and we, in a solemn but joyful way, name those who died in the past year, and then we remember saints from previous years, and it's just so moving. But right now, my church is, uh, we're doing a long, slow read of the book of Ephesians, and Paul in Ephesians often refers to the saints, and he doesn't mean the exemplary people, he just means the church people, right? You're a saint because you're one in Christ. Uh, but then at the same time, there are saints who are exemplary people who show the rest of the saints how to be saints, I think. And sometimes I have kind of a, uh, I call it denominational envy. That's not the right term. So uh, my mother-in-law, wonderful woman, uh, is buried just a few yards from that Moravian cemetery in Winston-Salem. And if you see the way the burials are done in the Moravian cemetery, <laughs> it's like, I wish you were over there. Uh, that's just such a cool way of doing it. Now, I have a lot of envy uh, from my Roman Catholic um, brethren and sisters uh, because they, they have saints. They have official saints, and they have a cal calendar. You know, as Dr. Atwood said, you know, we, we don't have dates for the people that we think of as heroic Christians, but in the Catholic Church, you know, you do. Um, and, and that's a great thing, right? Because then on, on a day, your fourth October 4th comes around, and you think about St. Francis of Assisi. And we think about his life, but also the fact that he died on October the 4th. That's why that became uh, his day. Uh, I've per on a personal note, uh, when I was at uh, Duke, I did my doctorate with a Roman Catholic named Father Roland Murphy. And uh, Roland was a Carmelite, and the Carmelites are devoted to Elijah in the Old Testament, who's a saint, Saint Elijah. And he had the panache uh, to die on the feast day of Elijah. Well, that's like an extra little twist for him and for, him, for his life, right? So that's a cool thing. So I envy that. The, uh, the officially canonized saints of the church are amazing. And we can spend our lives pondering them, uh, martyrs who went to their deaths uh, because of their faith in Christ. Uh, Dr. Atwood mentioned St. Augustine. Um, I, I, too, love St. Augustine. Some of what Augustine did is, and, and this is part of what the church needs. So he was a guy who figured out some theological things for um, <laughs> right? So he read the Bible, and he debated with other theologians, and he figured out things that we sometimes forget. Things like free will. Mm. And you ask the average American Christian, do you have free will? And they say, oh, by George, I do, and they're proud of it. But St. Augustine had a debate with a guy named Pelagius, who didn't become St. Pelagius, and he, what Augustine helps us see is that you're not free. You're shackled. You're shackled to sin. You're shackled to self. You're shackled to 
habit and convention. We need God's spirit to set us free. And that freedom isn't to go do stuff that we want to do. That freedom, right, is a life of diligent discipleship. Uh, so Augustine uh, did that great favor for us. Uh, St. Francis is uh, kind of everybody's favorite. Uh, he he uh, finds his way into you know, flower gardens and such, and is associated with birds. And that's some of Francis, but what's really striking about Francis is a bunch of things. So a lot of the medieval saints, when you read about them, they, they sound like kind of sour individuals, like very grim, serious about following Jesus. But Francis had this joyful obedience. Like it was just fun. There was laughter. He danced. So what Francis did is he took the Bible literally. So today people say that and they mean a bunch of things. But for Francis, it meant whatever he read in the Bible, uh, that was all his to-do list for the day. So he read, Jesus said, sell all you have and give it to the poor. And he said, okay. <laughs> and he sold all this stuff and gave it to the poor. His father was puzzled and appalled, but Francis uh, did that. Uh, Francis believed in the peacemaking thing. Here's something we could benefit from today. So he went off on one of the crusades. We forget Christians were warring with uh, the Muslims back in those days. Francis went on one of the crusades, and they came to a place called Damietta. And he had you know, the forces arrayed across no man's land, and everyone's armed. And, and Francis walked across no man's land, barefooted, unarmed, didn't have a weapon, and, and the Muslims started to kill him, but it was such a, a novelty that they thought, oh my goodness, so they took him to the Sultan, Maui Al Kamil, and Francis became friends with this Sultan. So we tend to think peacemaking is impossible, but here he had a saint who, I guess at risk to his own life, but yet with great joy and courage, simplicity, uh, found a way to befriend the enemy, right? And so that, that's an interesting uh, thing. Uh, the, the way that the saints through history have prayed, and you know, I'm a pastor and people ask me to pray for them and I'm happy, honored to do so. You know, 19 times out of 20, it, it's a health related thing, mm -hmm. which is interesting as we live in a place with great health care. But, but they want help for, and, and, but anyway, they, they pray for things. If you read the prayers of the saints, they don't pray for things so much. It's just intimacy with God. It's togetherness with God. It's union with God. If you have saints like St. Teresa of Avila or St. Teresa of Lisieux, who their prayer is, it's just they're together with Jesus. They love him and they love being with him. That, that's an amazing thing. Now, I wrote a book uh, years ago at the request of uh, Upper Room Books uh, on the saints, and they came up with the awkward title, Servants, Misfits, and Martyrs. And, um, but it's just a story. It's a book full of stories of saints, like the one I just told you about St. Francis. And we made the decision to use you know, not officially canonized Catholic saints, which is good because we were targeting uh, Protestants. And uh, so they don't have a calendar date, but you still have the, these um, uh, Protestants who are saints. I might even venture to suggest that I, in my world, there are even non-Christian saints. I want to allow that. People like, I don't know, Gandhi, show us things about how to live the Christian life, and they can be heroic. Uh, I have a rabbi friend. He is like a saint to me helps me to live the Christian life. Uh, of course, in my book, Being a Methodist, I wrote about the Wesleys, John and Charles Wesley. Uh, they could be cantankerous people. But also, they had a great debt to the Moravians. You know, they, they would say they, they really learned faith from their Moravian brethren, Peter Buehler, B, Peter Beeler and people like that. So uh, we're even saints are dependent. They're not just kind of morphed out of heaven with some kind of special gene. We're all dependent upon uh, others. Uh, I know when uh, Mother Teresa uh, came to Charlotte years ago and uh, had a regular column in the Charlotte Observer back then. And so I ventured into that column to say, what's remarkable about Mother Teresa? We tend to think saints have this like S gene in them. They have something I don't have. So that's not actually the case. Mother Teresa and I ventured, so I'm taller than she is. I'm stronger than she is. I may, I may have a higher IQ than Mother Teresa had, I don't know. 
So what's special about Mother Teresa isn't some superhuman trait. It's just that she, in a simple way, heard about Jesus, and Jesus said, care for the least of these, and she didn't think of reasons not to do it. She, she didn't excuse herself from that. She just said, I'll, I'll, I'll go do that. And she found great joy in doing that. Uh, so sometimes there's just a moment in someone's life, someone like Rosa Parks, who, she was a Methodist seamstress, uh, not in Birmingham, but down in Montgomery. Mm -hmm. And uh, she just had a saintly moment where, you know, Martin Luther said, here I stand. Rosa Parks said, here I sit. You know, she wouldn't give up her seat on that bus, which was uh, an amazing thing. Other people have longer lives and some aren't familiar and they can speak to our day in amazing ways. I'll just give you one example. There's a guy named Clarence Jordan, uh, who uh, back in the 50s in rural Georgia, uh, he read his Bible and he read in the book of Acts that the Christians held all of their possessions in common and there wasn't a needy one among them. And sort of like St. Francis, he took that as a, well, I'll go do that. So he started a farm called Koinonia Farm in rural Georgia in the 50s. And it was for everybody. So there were black people and white people. And you can imagine this just delighted the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, so they were terrorized constantly by uh, the Klan. And uh, Jordan had two moments out of his life uh, that are really interesting. One is that uh, the local uh, denomination, unnamed, church, called him in on the carpet to disband this farm and stop doing what he was doing. And uh, so uh, Jordan pulled out his Bible in the meeting uh, with these church leaders, and he said, show me in the Bible where it says that we shouldn't go to church together and we shouldn't live together. Show me in the Bible. And the uh, one guy responded by saying, don't give me that Bible stuff, which is a great moment. And, um, and, and then another thing in Clarence Jordan's uh, life, he had a daughter. You can imagine when you do courageous things for Jesus, if you're a saint, there's some costs to the people around you. We tend to forget about that. Like, oh, I'll be holy, but people are got to live with you too, right? So uh, Jordan had a daughter named Jan, and she kept coming home in tears from school. And it turned out because of what her dad did, kids were picking on her. And one boy in particular named Bob Speck, she said that every time she would pass him in the hallway, he'd knock her down and knock her books to the floor. And, uh, Jordan heard this, and he said to his daughter, Jan, he said, oh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Jesus to excuse me from being a Christian for about 15 minutes. I'm going to beat the daylights out of Bob Speck. And his daughter, Jan, said, Daddy, you can't be excused from being a Christian for 15 minutes. It's a great story, isn't it? Uh, and it's good that it comes out of the mouth of the daughter, not just the saint himself. Uh, there are uh, all kinds of saints that we could talk about. Uh, I, keep, I keep images around me everywhere because I'm somebody, I need reminders. So there, there's Francis, uh, there's Mary, the mother of Jesus. She's a great saint to ponder, right? She was just a Mother Teresa-like young woman in a little community. And, and God asked her to do something really unusual, which is carry the Son of God in her womb. But in a way, she was asked to do the same thing we're all asked to do, right? Which is let, let God take on flesh in you. Mm. And she said yes. And we're called to say yes. I have these saints behind me, and uh, I, I have pictures of my grandparents. So it, it's not always famous people, like you said, Bishop. It, a lot of times it's, it's just somebody you're related to or a neighbor, somebody that befriends you, somebody who goes out of the way and they're kind to you. And remember those people, we have such a debt to them. So I, I keep their images around me. Um, a lot of churches have theologies around icons, uh, which are lovely. Protestants need, need that, right? We need images of the holy. Uh, I talked to a Greek Orthodox priest the other day and he said, the, the icons, they're not pictures. He said, they're windows into heaven. Mm. Like, I, I need some windows into heaven. Something else that I wrote about icons recently is, you know, I, I put St. Francis there and I look at him and it helps, reminds me to be a little bit like St. Francis. But this author about icons said, one of the things you know is that uh, uh, it, it's not just that I'm looking at Francis, but uh, he's actually looking back at me. Mm. And if we believe in the communion of the saints, so Catholics have an idea that you can speak to the saints. And, and some Protestants say, oh, that's crazy, but I don't know, my father-in-law, 
Uh, his wife died a couple years ago, and we call him every night at 8.30. And then at 9.30 every night, he talks to Gene. And I believe he talks to Gene. At Christmas, we sing, sing all ye citizens of heaven above. I mean, we, we're invoking this togetherness with the communion of the saints. The world's going to think it's crazy, and that's fine. But, but, but God has opened that. There, there's this other reality that we're privileged to be a part of. I'm, I'm rambling longer than I meant to. But that, that's some of what saints mean to me. I think they help us to be holy. I think they remind us of what the faith is about. I think they challenge us to be uh, nobler, to be the people that we dream of being, but, but forget about over time. Thank you so much. I, I, I absolutely love the concept of um, the stories and how the stories of the saints really point us to the kind of life that he, we all as believers should aspire to be. I have pictures of my grandmother uh, where I can see them on a regular basis because as women, they inspire me. I'm reminded of, of their difficulties as women, Black women who grew up literally one generation, uh, two generations out of slavery. They didn't have access to education or all of the things that I enjoy. Uh, yet somehow th they were just so powerful and give me even now, years after their death, so much inspiration. Reminds me of that Hebrews passage, Hebrews 12, where it says, therefore we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. And of course that uh, follows this list in Hebrews 11 of all of these folks that we could consider as saints. But it does remind us that whatever they did in life, by faith, by faith. So it calls us to a, a greater awareness of uh, the role that others play in our lives. So um, let me see if you all want to respond to each other or ask each other any questions. I have a few questions uh, before we wrap things up. Uh, James or Craig, anything you all want to say to each other? One. One thing that occurred to me, especially while James was talking, that I think part of the benefit of this idea of the saints is uh, we lift up women's saints as well. Uh, you know, one of the criticisms of the Bible is there's not enough prominent female characters. You know, we get names of the saints who followed Jesus, Mary Magdalene, and so forth, um, and the co-workers of Paul, who I'm convinced were ordained. Um, but through the history of Christianity, we're able to lift up a lot of these um, important uh, women who have moved the church forward, um, either in their spirituality, like, you know, some of the um, Julian of Norwich and so forth, uh, or through their courage, like St. Perpetua, uh, or coming into the 20th century, you know, Sojourner Truth and uh, women like that. And so I personally think Protestants should pay a lot more attention to the mm -hmm. saints and, um, and honor the Virgin Mary more. I, I, I think that's been a lack in the Protestant church. We had a, um, a woman wanted to join my congregation a few months ago, um, uh, coming from the Catholic church. And her only concern was, would, she, would it be acceptable if she kept honoring the Virgin Mary? And the pastor wrote me and I said, tell her, absolutely. Moravians used to the Mary <laughs> Well, you, you, uh, you getting at one of the questions I had because I was wondering, uh, how can we start thinking of All Saints Day as a way of uh, inviting the church to be more inclusive and more diverse and, and more ecumenical in, in our practices and in our daily lives. So lifting up, I appreciate you lifting up uh, that inclusive, inclusiveness of women as uh, those who've had powerful impact on the church. Yeah, or I'd add just in general, we, uh, Craig, thank you for that. Uh, we, we, our country struggles now with division. Uh, everybody's afraid of anybody who's different. And so then they lash out in anger and judgment. And so 
and it's something I always tell my people. I say, if you only hang around with people who are like you, you'll become arrogant and ignorant. And I, I think it's correct. Yeah. On our church's All Saints Day, frankly, we are remembering people like us. So what the church needs is to stretch out to people that are different. So, uh, you know, who are the women who are, you know, one of the images I have here, you can't see that. That's a woman named Sarah Stevenson, who she's in her 90s and nearing death, but she was a hero in the civil rights movement here in Charlotte. Uh, and she's become a great friend, just a wonderful person. You know, around race conversations, I mean, wouldn't Christians do better if they thought about who have the saints among people of color been? What are their stories? And anyway, not, not to mention thinking about, say, Hispanic saints, given the debates that we have over immigration, it doesn't settle the question, but it humanizes it in a way, doesn't it? Absolutely. And it introduces a, some theology into that conversation, because the person that you're demonizing is, is a church person. Every immigrant that we've helped coming into the city here, they're Roman Catholics, and they're, they're, they've got the rosary beads, and they're, they're prayerful people. That changes it, because then it's somebody who's a member of the body of Christ. I, I like that, and I think particularly during this um, social unrest that we're experiencing and the way in which we have this immediate tendency to divide, uh, ways in which we can begin to see that even in our differences, we have some commonalities, uh, the Christian faith being one, but I think also just the desire for a better life, the desire to love our families and take care of, take care of them, the desire to live in communities that, that refresh us and, and nurture us. Um, so there's so much, so much that, that we can learn just by stopping and hearing these stories. I like, I'm a narrative theologian, so this concept of story is important. We're also in the midst right now, as we video uh, tape this, uh, a pandemic, a health crisis. How might All Saints Day speak to us? Uh, through what lens can can that can All Saints Day help us, uh, if not make sense of the pandemic, at least continue to stay faithful in the midst of it? This pandemic has been really hard for Moravians as well as you know many other. Christian churches, uh, because so much of our church is rooted in face-to-face -face community, hugging, um, uh, you know, kissing. We used to share the kiss of peace. Now it's a handshake, and now we can't even do the handshake anymore. Some of us are doing a hand on the heart and a little, little bow. Uh, part of what I have found strength in uh, with thinking of all saints and the communion of saints and specifically the Moravian tradition, is that this, is, this was virtual community before we had that term. Mm. Uh, and, you know, and I've thought about, you know, when, when Paul is writing his letters, um, you know, there in the first century, he's sharing in virtual community with people he can't see face to face. Mm. But he knows they're praying for them. They know he's praying for them. They're reaching out. We don't have the letters they sent back to him. They didn't make it in the canon, but you know he was getting them, uh, just like we get email today. Uh, the Moravians used to have a tradition that one Sunday a month, um, instead of the normal church service, they would read letters and reports from the Moravians in, in the Ooh. Caribbean, in South Africa, in Greenland, in America, uh, and pray for those people. And I, I think we really need to um, celebrate that our spiritual union doesn't depend on us breathing the same air at mm -hmm. the same time. Uh, and, and it's part of what I love about uh, this. Uh, I'm glad we're focusing on stories of the saints uh, because you know, those stories remind us of people who endured. Uh, pandemics aren't new, epidemics aren't new, disease isn't new. Um, and these are people who, who remain faithful in those times and gives us courage uh, that we can remain faithful. And, the, and one of the most important 
uh, verses in the Bible for me is that love is stronger than death. It's in the Song of Solomon. Uh, and uh, for me, this is what All Saints Day is a reminder, is that love is stronger than death. And when we sing for all the saints who from their labors bless, rest, um, you know, it gives us courage for this moment. Uh, but one of the reasons I think this, telling the story is important, I emphasize to my students that when we talk about Augustine, St. Perpetua, St. Athanasius, St. Well, he's not called Saint, but Origen, the theologian, they were all Africans. Mm. Uh, for me, All Saints Day is a great antidote to white supremacy in Christianity. Wow. wow. Uh, that, you know, this was, this was an African Middle Eastern religion you know, my, my German and Irish ancestors came along much later than Ethiopian Christianity. Uh, and we're still celebrating that. B before we gathered, uh, Bishop and I were talking that, you know, 85, 90% of uh, Moravians today are in Africa. Uh, you know, this, uh, this is something to celebrate that, uh, you know, the gospel of Christ is one of the most universal and unifying things. And constantly in the church, we have to uh, repent of our sins of supremacy, racism, arrogance, uh, you know, male sexism, all of these things. And I think the saints are a way to, to teach us to do that. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Craig, for saying that, because it, that, that really is a blessing to me, because I know that I have struggled with ways to really continue to appreciate uh, some of the more native African, um, African theology and African spirituality, which very much says you, you honor the saints, you honor the ancestors, you invoke their memory, you call on them. And um, I think uh, during an overzealous period of, of uh, colonization through Christianity, uh, there was so much sanitizing of, of the stories that really are rich. And so I, All Saints Day becomes this invitation for us to get beyond the sound bites of theology mm -hmm. and, and the key figures that we've been told about and really learn that there's a great deal of diversity and inclusivity uh, in the Christian story. Yeah, and I'd add that the, you know, if you read the lives of the saints, if somebody like St. Augustine, this is a, these are brilliant people mm -hmm. who know God well, and there's just, there, you don't pick up traces of, I've got it all figured out, and let me tell you how it is, right? Uh, and so, and that's kind of the big flaw today. People got everything figured out. There's no more truth to come. You know, on the pandemic thing, it, it occurs to me if we know if we learn about the saints that there's some lesson out of history, and I, I think of two that are really valuable. So, in the late 14th century, there was a woman named Julian of Norwich. Uh, why she's not a saint, I don't know, but anyway, uh, and she was shut up. People feel shut up in their homes. She was shut up in a cell for decades. Like, didn't go out. And she had these visions where Jesus spoke to her, and she wrote about the visions. And in the visions, the most memorable line that every seminary student can <laughs> quote is that Jesus said to her, all shall be well. Mm. And, I've, and I've tried to remind my people that during the pandemic, we're shut in the house, but she was shut in, but Jesus said to her, all will be well. And there's something about that. The other way people feel shut up, my, my father-in-law uh, is in a nursing home, and he says, it's like being in jail. <laughs> We've had saints who were in jail, right? Paul was in jail. St. Francis got thrown in jail by his dad for a while. Uh, and not not only, and then we think of more modern people, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, Bishop here in Birmingham, uh, Martin Luther King. I think John and, Lewis said he'd been in jail 40 times. <laughs> amazing. So uh, Martin Luther King in, in jail in Birmingham. I mean, I love the letter that he wrote there. He said, you know, when you, when you have time in your hands like this, you think strange thoughts. And he writes this really eloquent letter that works today, right? That's somebody a long time ago in a different but analogous situation. He wrote words that still speak to us. 
while he was in prison. And there's a lot of that kind of stuff. So uh, people who've been through what we've been through and way worse, uh, as Craig says, they, 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 they've overcome. Not that they've overcome, God has brought them through. Uh, and, and all is well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. By well, the way, they... Julian is officially a saint in the Episcopal Church. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, they were, so that, again, another benefit of us knowing each other's saints uh, can teach us a lot. Well, I want to thank you all so very, very much for your, um, for your time and for your expertise and for your insights. It really has been informative for me and I hope that those who will view this later will, will find it as such. And I just feel um, compelled to share just a quick story um, of something in, that's happened in real time uh, that I think really models how the church can live into this notion of we're all called to be saints. Uh, as you said, Craig, and, and, and how we can uh, look at the lives and the examples of others to see how we should live our lives uh, to model saintly behavior. So I have a church in Pensacola. And of course, Pensacola was hit fairly hard by uh, the most recent hurricane. Um, and on uh, Thursday, the day after the hurricane hit, I tried to make contact with the pastor and had a little bit of difficulty getting through, but finally reached him. And uh, it was fairly late in the evening on Thursday. And he said that, you know, he and his wife had to relocate to a hotel because um, there was no power, no water at their house. And uh, that they, they expected it would be two or three days before they really could get back because the wires were down, uh, water was still in the streets. So last night, he sends me a text message and about a dozen pictures that are just absolutely unbelievable. And uh, he, he it lets me know that they're still without power. Uh, some of his members have generators, uh, but most of them are pretty much relying on the National Guard and um, FEMA and some other agencies that are handing out food and water in, in their neighborhood. So I was immediately alarmed and convicted by that, thinking, oh, my goodness, here I am sitting in my house with my feet up, and these folks are down here without food to eat. <laughs> so I texted him back, and I said, what can we do to help? And he texted me back, and he said, just pray for us. He said, we have gotten together with all the other churches in the community, and we're bringing all of our grills, and tomorrow we're going to feed the neighborhood. And if you just pray for us, we'll be all right. And I thought, what an amazing story. The expectation that at, their, at the height of their need, they saw it as their calling to reach out to others who are in need. So for me, uh, today, my members in Pensacola are saints. They're embodying the true nature of what God has called all of us to be. And, and I'm grateful that that little vignette reminds me that ordinary people are the saints, become the saints, and they are the saints. And we shall all should strive to do likewise in our lives. So thank you both so very much, uh, Reverend Dr. Craig Atwood and Reverend Dr. James Powell. May God continue to bless you. And I look forward to uh, perhaps one day meeting in person, or if not, uh, we will continue this virtual communion uh, of, of uh, this body of uh, believers who, interesting, it struck me, somehow have a lot of um, history in common, that Moravian Methodist connection. <laughs> means we're kindred spirits. God bless each of you, and uh, thank you so very much. God bless you as well. Thank you. I enjoyed it immensely.